Hi, Journey Church family. It's me, Pastor Luke. Here we are again, gathered together to worship God together. If you haven't met me before, I'm the senior pastor here at the Journey Church. And I just want you to know that we're thrilled that you're a part of our worship service uh, with us here together. And the thing I'd like to encourage you to consider uh, over the, the coming you know, 45 minutes to an hour or so here is that uh, we don't want for this to be something where you simply watch a video and then kind of go on with your life. Um, this is intended to be a worship service and that's an entirely different thing than just consuming content. You know the difference, like you're out working, you know, you're cutting the grass, you, you know, working on your mower or something like that and you're listening to a podcast or something, right? That's kind of that content absorbing mode that a person can get in. What we're encouraging you to do is to step aside from the rest of the things that would be normally distracting you today. You know, maybe uh, if you're not watching this on your phone, set aside your phone. Uh, you know, get yourself into a posture where you feel ready to pray with us, uh, even within the song that we're gonna have later. You actually worship with us. You know, the worship relationship between us and God really is this kind of, uh, this thing that has give and take in it. It's not just we just sing songs or we just listen to a speaker. We're really interacting with the God of heaven and earth. And that's our intention for us, for you, uh, over the course of this worship service. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna um, pray a prayer of invocation. And so what that means is that we're praying that God himself will come and be a part of our worship service as we are gathered here together. So whether you're sitting at your computer chair or on your couch or you're outside or sitting on a chair or something like that, would you just pray with me now? God, our Father, we dedicate this worship service to you, to your glory and to your fame. We know that you've given all glory to your Son and he's the one that brings us to you. We pray, Father, that you will see fit to receive our praise that we offer up to you. We pray that you will be present in each of the homes of the folks that are participating in this worship service. Lord, we pray even now that you will be drawing people to yourself, people that haven't known you, that haven't walked with you, or have left your ways for some time. We pray that even as we're praying now that you will be gathering more folks to yourself through our worship service and so that the, the work that we do here and the prayers that we offer and the songs that we sing and the message that we hear will point people towards you and we're hoping that folks will come to know you because of the work that we do here. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So the next thing I'd like for us to think about here is what we call our testimony time. So each week we've been sharing stories of things that have been going on within our community about ways that people are serving uh, each other and serving uh, neighbors in the community. And I had, a, I had a member of our church come up and chat with me uh, a little over a week ago and he said, you know, sometimes when we hear about the scale of like, you know, risk factors, one, two, and three versus seven, eight, nine, ten. He said, sometimes those of us that feel like we're more at risk uh, with our health, we feel bad if we're not going after things that are six, seven, eight risk level numbers. And what I want to be clear about here is that when we put numbers to something like that, we're not advocating necessarily that you should take on more risk. That's not what we're getting at. What we're trying to get the uh, understanding around is that whatever God's calling you to do, that's what you should be doing. And you shouldn't allow things like what other people say about it keep you from doing what God's calling you to do. So I wanted to be clear about that. We're not advocating that for you to be a six, seven, eight risk level is somehow better than a two, three, or a four. Um, but there is this sense in which there's some folks that are more naturally risk takers and they may think of themselves more highly because other people aren't taking more risk. But that, that doing that is as much being in the flesh as a person that's being overly timid from what God's calling you to do. The question isn't, do you feel like you should be more risky or do you feel you should be less risky? The question is, what do you think God's calling you to do? All right, so I wanted to kind of clarify that for us here as a group. But over the last couple of weeks here, there were some really cool things happening within our community. So a number of times we've been talking about our partnership with Northlight Ministry. This is a ministry that takes care of folks in our community that don't have quite as much. And so we had a, uh, a gathering in which people got to share their resources, their financial resources, some of the 
paper products, cleaning products that they had around the house, some of their laundry detergent, those kinds of things. And would you believe it, we were able to fill 40 baskets uh, with stuff for people that need it. Um, over $300 was raised to help provide some of those resources. And those things were provided um, in the Kingsley area with uh, our friends over at the uh, the Orchard Church uh, to get those things out to people that needed them. Um, Channels 9 and 10 News actually captured Pastor Molly, our own Pastor Molly here from the Journey Church, who also serves as the director of the North Light Ministry, in which she was sharing that this is something that folks that don't have a lot of income, this really takes some pressure off them. Imagine that if every penny counts, not having to spend money on detergent for a week or, or having to buy paper towels for a week. That matters for folks. And so it was so cool to know that we had seven people from the Journey Church who gathered here um, and they wore their personal protective equipment and did the social distancing thing, but they were able to sort and pack those 40 baskets for folks in our community that needed it. So that was really cool. Um, another thing that's really cool that's been going on in our community is our prayer walks. We've been getting numbers of people either emailing us or putting on our social media pages that they are participating in these prayer walks. And make no mistake about it, a prayer walk isn't some sort of just extra activity that doesn't matter. No, when you are going on a prayer walk and you're asking the Holy Spirit to be moving through you, I mean, you think about spiritual warfare. Put that next to uh, a war that would happen between two countries, right? Like it's one thing for a nation to be fighting another, but it's a whole nother thing when you put your feet on the opponent's soil, right? And there's a spiritual there's a spiritual parallel here. When you're going on a prayer walk and you're inviting the spirit to move through you, you are taking his spirit and you're occupying a piece of territory for the kingdom of God. It's a tremendously powerful thing to do, to be a part of. I bumped into one of our old friends, Ben Schneider. He helped us out with one of our text and just one thing deals that we did a little over a month ago. And I shared this idea with him and he thought, man, maybe I should do something like that too. Please friends, if you have friends that are Christ followers, even if they don't go to our church, invite them to consider taking a neighborhood, to actually walk through a neighborhood and say to, say to the Lord, God, I am here on your purposes. If you have a conversation for me to have, if there's a force of darkness you want to put down through my presence, if you want to use me as an encouragement, God, I'm here for that. I'm here for you. Uh, it's a tremendously powerful thing, and we're hearing lots of stories about people that are doing this. So please consider being a part of that with us here.
a big thank you to Jeannie and Jerry Mitchell for providing our musical worship. It's so cool that we have a church family that spans multiple generations of folks that worship God in different and interesting ways. So we're so grateful to them for doing that. The main thing I want to talk about for our announcements this morning is the fact that we as your church community want to lift you up in prayer before the Father. And so one of the ways that we're able to do that is if you help include us in on what's going on in your lives. So you can either send us an email or one of the preferred ways we'd like for you to consider is uh, we'll have a link below for where you can check in with our new app that we're doing. Uh, you can tell us that you're a part of our worship service and you can submit your prayer requests there. And what we want you to understand is that for each of our prayer requests, we pray for you by name and try to talk to the Lord about those situations that are going on in your life. So whether you have a praise or whether you have a prayer request, we would love to support you in that way. So please take a moment even now to let the church know about what's going on in your life. If it's something that's more public, feel free to post it right there in the chat, right in the Facebook chat. If you're watching it there or on YouTube, put it right inside there as well. So that's the big thing I wanted to talk with you about for announcements. The other thing you may want to know is that we have ongoing services that we've been offering for adults on Thursdays, for students on Wednesdays and for children on Saturdays. So if you go to our website, tcjourney.org, you'll be able to see links to all those things right there. So make sure that you're taking part in one of these things and staying connected with your church family. So next thing that we have coming up here is our message for the Sunday. Pastor Molly Van Zant will be leading us in this sermon. She's been working really hard on it, has some really interesting, cool things to say, and has a real fresh take on a passage you may have heard preached about many times. But please pay attention and tune in to what Pastor Molly has for us today from God's Word. Hi, I'm Pastor Molly, and I'm so pleased to be able to bring the message to you today. And... As I was thinking about our passage of scripture today, and, and I was thinking about all of the things that were going on right now in our own community, I started to think about how the news of the Cherry Festival here in Traverse City and other festivals around Michigan have been canceled. And it, it got me wondering, what what's this summer going to be like? You see, all my life, I've lived with the reality of summer tourism. When I was growing up, I lived in a little town, not too far from Traverse City, where most of the year it was relatively quiet. There wasn't much traffic. In fact, there was only one stoplight in the whole county. Uh, many of the main street businesses were closed for the season, uh, leaving only the essentials like grocery stores and gas stations and banks. But when summertime came, it was a whole different story. It was transformed into a new place. There would be a constant stream of traffic and hardly a parking spot to be found. People everywhere, crowded grocery stores and lots and lots of extra activity, like art fair markets and outdoor concerts. I loved summer because it brought with it a liveliness, it brought activities and opportunities that just disappeared at the end of the season, along with all of the tourists. After Larry and I got married, I got to experience a new side of tourism. Now people weren't just coming into my town, but they were coming to my home. You see, Larry and his parents owned a, and operated a little hotel resort on East Bay. Our home was there on the property, and it truly was a beautiful place to live. Uh, we had a sandy beach, and we got to watch the sun set over the bay every evening. And we got to build relationships with people who would come back year after year to enjoy their vacation with us at our little hotel on the bay. And as always, summertime brought with it a liveliness, a busyness, and a, a, a flurry of activity right to my doorstep. But that is where it stopped, my front door which was marked with a beautiful little sign that said, Private. My house was my place of rest and retreat from the barrage of activity that was just outside my front door. The business of accommodating vacationers, tourists, and weary travelers ended at my front door. Now, there was still lots of activity inside of the house with three kids enjoying their summer vacation, but it was personal not business. And we were all very protective of that space. Larry and his dad were very diligent, uh, meeting customers right in the parking lot as they drove in to avoid strangers from coming and knocking at our front door. 
our personal space was set apart. Even though it was the same property, guests could come and go. They could drive in and out of the driveway. Uh, they could enjoy the beach in the yard, play around in mini golf and, or play some shuffleboard and enjoy nightly bonfires complete with marshmallows. But the house was off limits for business. Think of this concept about having this personal space, your home, your living room. Think of it being invaded by a stranger or someone setting up a business on your front porch. People walking in your house to use the bathroom or raid your refrigerator. How would that make you feel? Hold on to that thought as we turn to our scripture. Now, just to give us a little bit of background on this scripture, the Gospel of John records three different Passover feasts and Jesus Jesus participating in those. And this one is the first. This is a separate account from the, from the accounts of Jesus clearing the temple in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Therefore, this is, often refer, this is often referred to as the first temple clearing. Let's read uh, chap, John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. The Passover feast was a special time, a time set apart to worship God. And Jerusalem, specific, and specifically the temple in Jerusalem, was a special place, a place that was set apart for worshiping God. Jews from all over the world came to Jerusalem for Passover. And unlike the tourism that we see and experience here, uh, like the throngs of people that come in for Cherry Festival. This wasn't simply a family vacation or something fun to experience. This was a part of the Jewish law. Check out what it says here in, in Deuteronomy. Chapter 16. Observe the month of Aviv and celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God because the month of Aviv he brought you out of Egypt by night. Sacrifice as the Passover to the Lord your God, an animal from your flock or herd, at the place that the Lord cho will choose as a dwelling for his name. You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town except for the, the place that he chooses as a dwelling for his name. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down, on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. So this was a time and a place that was set apart to remember God's deliverance from slavery and to offer a sacrifice as an act of worship and thanksgiving, which was decreed by God. He said, this is what you should do. So by doing that, they're following God's law. But what did Jesus see when he got there? when he arrived at this special place that God chose. Animals for sale, cattle and sheep and doves, money changers exchanging coins. It was a marketplace. It would have been like one of our hotel guests sleeping in my bed or some stranger setting up a used car sales lot in your front yard. Now to help us to get a better picture of what was going on here, let's, let's take a minute to talk about the structure of the temple. The, de the temple was divided into different courtyards. Each had a different level of who could enter. There was an outer courtyard, a larger inner courtyard, and then a courtyard for sacrifices, an inner courtyard that only priests could enter. And then there was this most reserved place 
the holy of holies, which no one could enter except for the high priest, and he was only allowed to enter one day of the year. So most likely, this marketplace was set up in the outer courtyard, the court of the Gentiles. Now, the court of the Gentiles was the only place that non-Jewish people were allowed to enter. It was here that anyone could inquire of the rabbis and the teachers of the law, who is this one true God that you worship? It was a place set apart for respectful and compassionate dialogue where people could ask questions and learn about God. Now, what kind of respectful dialogue do you think could happen in a marketplace filled with noisy animals and people haggling over prices and the business of money exchanging going on? But this makeshift market wasn't just taking up space and making noise. Sellers were also taking advantage of the high demand. They were charging exorbitant amounts for the animals and a steep rate for the exchange of coins. These animals were needed as an act of worship, as a sacrifice for the Passover. And remember, people were traveling from long distances and they needed to purchase the animals once they arrived. And the temple only accepted the Jewish coin for the temple tribute. Exchanging their money for the temple currency was, re- was a requirement. So this holy, sacred place, meant to be set apart for spiritual inquiries and spiritual growth, was now a money-making business market. This profitable scheme, which, by the way, was precipitated by the priests, not only takes advantage of people coming to worship, but it profanes the holy temple. It obstructs the act of worship and distracts from its purpose. This sacred, holy place, this place that was set apart for spiritual worship, is replaced by a major business. And Jesus gets mad. Now, this is a different picture of Jesus than we often see portrayed. We often think of a a simply meek and mild Jesus, never offended or on the offense. But this accounts reminds us that Jesus is more than just meek and mild. He's passionate and full of zeal. Jesus takes action. He fashions a whip out of some ropes and drives the madness of the market right out. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business, he says, as he scatters the sheep and cattle with his whip, expels the sales force, and overturns the money tables, leaving the money changers scrambling to collect their scattered coins. His display of intense passion, fervor, and zeal reminds his disciples of a prophetic description of the Messiah from Psalm 69, verse 9, which John quotes, He says, zeal for your house will consume me. And while this certainly describes the situation, let me share with you the rest of that verse from Psalm 69. It says, zeal from your house consumes me and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. This is a great offense or insult to God. And Jesus takes it personally. The temple is to be a place of worship and prayer, which is all about God. It's a place that he set apart for himself, where people can encounter him, draw near to him, get to know him, and give of themselves to him. A place of business is very much the opposite of that. Business is about self. It focuses on self-sufficiency, self-gain, How much can I get for myself rather than how much can I give of myself? And it is this attitude that Jesus, and it is with this attitude that Jesus is approached by the priests. Let's take another look at John chapter two. This time we're going to begin with uh, verse 18. 
Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The the Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now the priests here, they were indignant. Jesus certainly caused them a major loss of profit. Prove your authority. It's kind of like saying, who do you think you are coming in here and telling us what we can and can't do? Show us a sign of your authority. Show us your badge. And while Jesus didn't immediately produce a sign, his answer is a foretelling of the ultimate sign of authority. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is now talking about a different temple, his body. And as the word made flesh, With the indwelling of the Father and the Holy Spirit, his body was a temple in a very unique way. And this temple, in it, the ultimate sacrifice is given. And with this sacrifice, the veil separating the Holy of Holies, uh, it's torn. And the Holy Spirit is given to all who will believe. Here we're introduced to the concept that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That we are not limited to a specific place where God chooses to dwell because he's chosen to dwell in us. The prophet Joel tells us that in the day of the Lord, God will pour out his spirit on all people. The apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And Peter puts it this way. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, he's talking about Jesus, who was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and is precious to him. You also are like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are to be holy, to be set apart for God's purposes. Problems start to come in when business gets in the way of our worship. We set things up like fear, anxiety, pride, self-gain, and prejudice. The foundation of our dependence is often our bank account rather than on God. We can easily and readily proclaim our, our political preferences, yet Never take time for a respectful and compassionate dialogue about the one true God that we believe in and worship. We, like the livestock peddlers and the money changers, sometimes need some tables turned and worries scattered. Let us take advantage of this opportunity that we have right now. While the world is has slowed down, where things have the pause button has been pushed to evaluate what are those temples that we've, or what are those tables that we've been setting up? What are those places of business that get in the way? Let's clear out our temples of the things that obstruct and distract us from worship in spirit and in truth. And those things that are barriers that make it difficult for others to see Jesus in us. Well, first thing, Pastor Molly, I just wanna thank you so much for taking the time to prepare a sermon for us. It was uh, incredibly moving to hear your characterization of 
the temple, the inner sanctum of the temple, feeling like that safe place when you guys owned the resort hotel. Like, talk a little bit more about that feeling. I mean, the feeling of this is supposed to be the safe place and they've turned it into, <laughs> you know, a cattle market. Right, well, you know, lots of people, that's kind of how they naturally feel about their their home and in their property. You don't, people only come in unless they're invited personally. And, um, and so there was a whole different feel at the hotel. So once I walked out my, my front door, the property, was shared with all these other people that were there and um and i had a, it was a two-level house and on the second level there was a little deck and it had just a just a small little wall that but it, because it was up just high enough i could be up there and nobody would know mm -hmm. and 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 towards especially towards the end of the summer like august i would just get really tired of having to answer the same questions oh what was your how's your summer been? And, you know, like this, because we have new people every week, right? It's new to them every time. You know? <laughs> and so I'd have to have the same conversations week after week after week. And, it, and I would just be okay. I've, I've had enough of these conversations and I'd sneak out on that deck and mm -hmm. be able to have this, my, this own private little space that was outside that I could enjoy the sunshine and people wouldn't know I was there. It was, mm -hmm. um, it was really valuable. And then in, in contrast to that, but we moved to to where we are now, which is thirteen acres out in the out in the country, um, pretty far away from from the beach, you know. And a lot of people would ask, "Don't you miss living on the water, living on the beach?" And I would say, "No way! Mm. I have thirteen acres of my own land that uh, yeah. <laughs> that I get all to myself." And well, that, and, that, so, that makes me think, though, of uh, the other thing I wanted to talk with you about. So. You talked a little bit there about the quiet and sort of this mm -hmm. sense that within God's house, there's this place for quiet. And you contrasted that with um, the word business. And you almost, when you talked about business, you also included their busyness right. was a piece right. of that as well. When you think about how you'd counsel people to approach their walk with God, um, how do you get people to step away from this sort of transactional business relationship with God and to sort of that, that personal quiet? How do you do that in your own life? Well, that's a really good question. How do I do that in my own life? Um, by shutting out the busyness. Um, that uh, making that time that's set apart. You know, mm -hmm. having that time that's set apart. Having a place that's set apart. Um, have a an office that current. I'm, my kids had moved a whole bunch of stuff in there in my office, which was mm. full of stuff. Like I can hardly even walk in there. And so it's been almost two years that I've been able to use my office space. And with the um, with the current situation and having a little more time on my hands, mm. I'm like, I am going to clean out my office. And I cannot tell you the world of difference I made because this is my space. Mm. This is, um, I can close the door and I can lock it. Mm. <laughs> and... Um, and, and it's just kind of out of the way. So it's not right in the middle of all of the household activity. Mm. And so having that, having time and place that's set apart, that's designated, um, is, is how I, I get mm. to that place and that quiet, that quiet time. Um, and then just practicing uh, quieting my mind and uh, trying to put all of those things away that um, yeah. the day-to-day -day stuff that... You know, I, I can think about those things later. Yeah, and so as a as a working professional who's also a mom, who's also running a nonprofit, mm -hmm. who's doing all these other things, it really sounds like you've found the need for that that inner sanctum, mm -hmm. and that's really been tied to having a particular place and a particular time to do it. And I think we'd all be well advised mm -hmm. to have something like that in there. You talked about another aspect in there that I'd like for you to highlight, where you you mentioned that sometimes God gets mad, like <laughs> you know, sometimes God gets mad, yeah. like. And, and, and that's, a, that's as much a part of who he is mm -hmm. as that, that joyful, loving side of him. Mm -hmm. How does it inform your opinion of God to know that he, yeah, while he's loving, he also gets angry sometimes? How does that inform your view of him? Well, it's, it's not just the lovable teddy bear view. It's, it's a whole person and, and it's a real relationship. And so when um, in in my relationship with my husband, when I ignore him or when I put other things in front of our relationship, 
he's not happy about that. Mm -hmm. And it, it isn't it conducive to that healthy relationship. And in the same sense, Jesus is a real person. He, he's, um, and he experiences all of that kind of emotion. And we can't just put one facet on him. He's multifaceted and, and even more multifaceted than a human being. He's God. Mm-hmm. He's so much bigger than we can even imagine. And so having this, the scripture where we see Jesus, Jesus is really mad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful paintings of, of this particular scripture and just seeing a, this really uh, passionate Jesus. Mm. Uh, but also the other thing that um, one thing that I didn't mention is it's talking about the fact that Jesus stopped and he took some time to make a whip. Mm. He didn't just go off and explode and it wasn't, an it wasn't un- volatility right? right it wasn't an uncontrolled anger it was purposeful and it was passionate and it and and so also we can trust god god is not just gonna go off mm. unexpectedly or unreasonably uh we can trust that you know if god's angry he has a really good reason to be angry mm-hmm. and and he, the way he's going to handle his anger is going to be appropriate. Yeah, and you kind of hinted at this as well, but there's a real sense there too in which Jesus is serving as a defender of the defenseless. Right. That's the other piece to it. He's right. not just going mad. It's like there are people that are here to worship and they mm-hmm. can't do that. And so he's right. defending the people that don't have a voice, right? right? Yeah. And that's kind of encouraging to think about God being that way. So right. thanks for, you kind of hinted at that a little bit yeah. there in the message. So the last question I'd just like to ask for you, when you think about, you mentioned the fact that we live lives for business, that in, in a sense, when you're talking about a business, um, a business scoreboard is making money, mm-hmm. right? That's what a business is for. But what I don't want for people to get the sense is that means that the work that you're doing in business isn't holy or isn't an act of service or can't be in an act of love. And I don't think you were getting right, at right. that, but talk mm-hmm. to us a little bit about how a person who is about business, who owns a business, who leads a business, can can also be a person of tremendous faith with quiet. Talk to us a little bit about right. that. So in our scripture, uh, people were coming and there was a real need and, and they were providing for that need. They were providing the animals. They were providing the money exchange. The problem wasn't the business. Mm. The problem is where the business was being held. Mm. The wrong place, it wrong was the, time. It was the wrong place in the wrong time. And... Um, and also the fact that they were taking advantage. Exorbitant. Uh, yes. And, yeah, yeah. That they were really playing it up, trying to make some money. Um, and so when we think about our own business, we're, we think about, you know, is are we doing the business, our business appropriately? Mm-hmm. Are we, are we being fair in our, in our business? Are, are we not taking advantage of people? And in fact, are we trying to, to help people with our business? Right. Mm-hmm. And um, the other thing is, are, is it the, in the appropriate time and the appropriate place? Yeah. So absolutely. do we bring our business home with us? Do we, do we try and do business at church? Mm. You know, like how many people, you know, they're like handing out the business cards. <laughs> yeah. and not, and, and, you know, networking is, is all fine and good, but is that the only reason that you're coming? Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, um, so things like that. So mm-hmm. absolutely the business their their business was a legitimate business and it was off it was it was necessary it was right necessary. like you're saying people can't travel right. 500 miles right. carrying a lamb with them all under right. their arm you know like right, right. so yeah. um it was just the time the the in the place where they were doing their business well, great well thank you so much pastor molly mm-hmm. for being willing to, to do our sermon and to share some of your thoughts with me and things like that i know the congregation really appreciates mm-hmm. it so what we're going to do now is we're going to close in prayer this is the last thing for the worship service um, so after we're done here, that'll, that'll be it. So let's pray. God, we thank you for the word that was preached today. And we pray that you will be raising up right now young men and women that will be zealous for your house the way that Jesus was, that will have passion about the way that they go about the ministry and, um, and about the family business that you're in. We thank you that you are a good God who has given us your word. And we pray that it will prove effective in the lives of the people that are around us. We pray for protection for the folks that are in our congregation. And we pray your blessings over each one of them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday around the same time at 1030.